Good morning, um, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Marco Vicencino. I'll be the master of ceremonies for the Athena 40 Forum until 1430 GMT today. We are usually excited to welcome you today. As this very year, as this very tough year is coming to a close, we gaze towards the future with optimism, creativity, and a sense of responsibility for our world and each other. This message permeates our all day Athena 40 Forum on December 9th, which is dedicated to leadership models in a new world. We put it together with our enthusiasm at its max, along with knowledge that we must all become more caring as humans. I am delighted to introduce now the founder and CEO of Athena 40, Elizabeth Philippouli. Thank you, Marco. Good morning from London. And I am incredibly excited uh, to welcome you all today to the Athena 40 Forum. If this had been a normal year, that forum would have taken place a few months ago, last April, but uh, change seems to be the new normal in our lives. And so much as this may sound uncertain and scary, it can also be very exciting. Most changes can be scary, we know that, but it does not mean that they do not lead to things which are amazing because they do lead to new beginnings, uh, to new explorations and make us test our strength, our courage and caring. So I guess 2020 will register in history as perhaps one of the scariest years in the story of mankind. But hey, it is what it is. And so as humans, we need to be resilient and we are. We also need to be resourceful in order to survive. And in order to thrive, we need each other. And this is one of the greatest lessons that this pandemic has taught us. So today, this full day uh, is hosting a stellar lineup of international leaders. And the reason why we're hosting it is because we want to generate inspiration and we want to boost our confidence, our ability to learn and become wiser, our ability to become more accountable and also to reinforce the belief in ourselves that we can rise up again and we can thrive, not only survive, but triumph. Our future is here, it has arrived. And I wish to thank all our speakers and contributors who are joining us today. We created Athena 40 as a platform that enables women to shape the future of leadership, but also as a space for all people, regardless of gender, to contribute compassion, competence, and confidence, the main theme of our forum today. These are the three virtues that our world is in need of. So the day is just beginning. Grab your coffee or tea, enjoy a great variety of ideas, views, people, personal stories that I promise you will lift you up. Athena 40 connects visionaries and you're certainly among them. That's why you're here. So make it interactive, raise your questions throughout the day. Marco Vicenzino, it is a great privilege to have you as our MC. And so now over to you for the first panel of the day. The global crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic highlights the critical role of science, technology and innovation and better understanding, containing, curing, and preventing pandemics. The conversation will also visit technology trends that can help build a resilient society, as well as considerations about their effects on how we do business, how we trade, how we work, how we produce goods, how we learn, and how we seek medical services, and how we entertain ourselves. I am delighted to introduce the moderator, Helen Disney, CEO of Unblocked. She is the chair of this panel. Just some housekeeping rules uh, notes before we hand over to the moderator. I would ask all participants, please stay within the 50 minute time frame as we need at least five minutes for the next time to prepare and go live. May I ask that everyone switches their phones off? If you lose connections, not to panic, just try to log in again through the same link. We have a, we have a questions and answers section where the moderator can see, take live questions to raise with all panelists. Helen, over to you. Thank you, Marco, and thank you both to you and Elizabeth for inviting me to open this first panel of the day. I'm truly honored, not just to be involved with Athena 40 and Global Thinkers Forum, which are amazing organizations, but also to have such a 
fantastic panel of speakers with me this morning. We've got incredible women from all over the world who are experts in economics and investing and technology transformation in influencing policy. And I'm really delighted to be able to give you 40 minutes of their thoughts and insights into what's been going on in the world and in particular, how technology has affected all of our lives so enormously this year. Um, it's obviously been the most unusual year and we've all relied on technology for social interaction to continue to access information and education to be able to work from home to access um, you know remote healthcare and also to use technology for humanitarian purposes and I think we're going to have a really interesting discussion about how we continue to use technology to build more resilient societies also whether or not this digital divide that we have has, has widened during the pandemic or whether it's actually been able to help people to sort of improve their lives and, and minimize their, their disconnection. Um, and we're gonna look a bit at the future of social entrepreneurship as well. So I'm gonna um, not spend too much time talking about myself, but just to introduce me briefly, um, my name is Helen Disney. I'm the CEO of a platform called Unblocked, which helps business people and policymakers understand emerging technologies like blockchain, AI, and so forth. Um, and these technologies are already changing our world, but many people don't know about them and don't understand them. So the first step is to widen our understanding. With me, I also have an amazing panel, as mentioned, from all over the world. We have Dr. Jane Thomason here, who's a technology transformation leader. We have Vicky Price, the economist and author of Women Versus Capitalism. We've got Janet Salazar, who's executive chairman and president of FSUN. Nena Nakwam, I'm going to say this wrong. Sorry, Nena. Nena Nguan Kanma, who's the chief web advocate of the World Wide Web Foundation. And Priya Guha, who's long been an advocate for investing in women-led businesses and is venture partner at Marion Ventures. So first of all, welcome to everybody. I'm going to start off with Vicky. Um, we've been talking um, in our kind of preliminary discussions about particularly how the pandemic has affected women and obviously uh, GTF and Tina 40 are women focused organizations looking at mentorship and encouraging entrepreneurship and confidence in women. So we've all got our views about how this situation has affected women, but I wanted to ask Vicky specifically that she's been looking at the data on the pandemic as far as it affects women and I'd love to just give us um, a little bit of uh, information about how those trends are developing and what the data actually says so Vicky if you can put your camera if it's not already on we'd love to hear from you. Thank you Helen I hope the camera is on that you can see me and hear me and thank you very much for the introduction delighted to be on this panel um, and uh, delighted to have been asked to contribute to this really important event. Well, yes, um, COVID and the impact on women. I mean, we already know, of course, that uh, women uh, tend to work quite a lot in the care sectors. I mean, the interesting thing is that if you look across the world, the estimate is that women are um, almost twice as likely to be losing their jobs during the pandemic. And yet they're the ones who have been dominating the front line of the National Health Service more generally and the care sectors more generally. Um, which is uh, quite a worry because they're hit in both ways. First of all, their health, um, and second, of course, their livelihood uh, for the longer term. And the interesting thing is that uh, globally, they represent something like 70% of all health workers, yet in that area, they face a pay gap of 28%, as um, again, 16% against all sectors. So uh, yes, they are more vulnerable to health issues, but also they get paid less while they are tackling uh, all these areas for us. And there are some other issues which are long-term and which might affect where women might be in the future. I mean, the UN again suggests that some 11 million girls worldwide, and frankly, I'm surprised that it is just 11 million, it could be more, will leave school early because of the pandemic and will never return, which of course affects crucially their earning capability through their life after that. And of course, the, the gender pay gap that I have mentioned. And even in places where things have continued and girls are likely to go back to school, we've seen quite an issue about childcare places, quite a lot of childcare uh, uh, proximity for, for um, working mothers has disappeared. Uh, loads of places that would have offered that type of support have closed. And again, the question is whether uh, any of those will in fact uh, reopen. Uh, so what, uh, in fact, most studies have shown is that women um, from any background, really, but, but particularly those who are in the lower paid jobs, are among the groups which are most likely 
to lose the jobs or have a reduction in pay. And even in places like the UK, what we found is that um, whereas men who had been kept on payrolls by firms supported by government help, and I have to admit that across the world, we've seen a lot of stimulus coming either directly from individual governments or through the World Bank, the IMF, and now increasingly actually the EU uh, to sustain jobs and particularly look after the health sector. But what we've seen is that quite a lot of places like the UK have had the government intervene and keeping people at uh, you know, employed in inverted commas, even though they didn't do any work during particularly the lockdowns that we have seen in a number of places. What has tended to happen is that the government covers a certain percentage of your pay and quite a lot of employers then make up the difference by paying you the rest of what they would have paid you anyway. Big saving for the employer, uh, of course, and at least it keeps the employee with some money in their pockets to spend at some point in the future or to keep them going during that period. What we find is that the top-ups happen mostly to the men. The women have tended not to get that type of top-up, um, or at least if they get it, they get, uh, they get it a lot less than the men. Uh, and what is also happening is that the, the, the women who work in areas like hospitality, retail and so on, those that have been most affected by the lockdowns and the pandemic more generally, are of course also the ones who are most likely to be losing their jobs. And then of course the support that is given uh, by the government for those who have actually lost their jobs is a lot less than if you were kept on for a while in jobs that are going. So the interesting thing about women is that through the years, despite progress in government legislation, removing the barriers that exist in order to take away some of the market failures that are there that encourage women to be much more involved in the job um, market and therefore be more prosperous. You know, despite all this, the pay gap has remained and women tend to ghettoize the areas of low pay. Uh, what it means, of course, is that those areas of low pay are those which are generally more client facing more you know other you know people to people jobs um and those are the ones that have suffered most during covid and and the 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 pandemic measures that have been taken since particularly keeping people at home and uh, and not having that type of interaction so they are the ones who have found themselves unable to do that work more easily and if you look at the type of inequality that we might have when we get out of this what you see is that the higher the pay of a person is, the more likely it is that the tasks that they're involved in doing can be done from home. The lower the pay, the less that is the case. And which means that obviously it is the people at the lower end of the pay scale who are the ones who suffered mostly. And who is it who occupies this lower pay uh, part of the labor market? It is women and they are re removing themselves to a very considerable extent from the labor market altogether. Because in addition to everything else that they have to do, they also have had to look after their children a lot more than the men. Um, and the care responsibilities have been such that they have been unable to actually devote the time of, of uh, uh, the work time that they, is required of them to be able to keep their jobs. So we will be leaving this pandemic with a huge problem, probably, going backwards in terms of gender equality, even in the UK where the government had forced the big firms to report their job, uh, um, their pay differences in their organizations yearly. Uh, we've seen that that is postponed for this year. So by the time we get out of this, who knows where women will be and how badly they will be affected. So there's a big job to do. A lot of uh, direct help needs to go there. We're talking about direct help on sectors but actually what isn't happening is direct help for women to get back to work and avoid the fall into poverty, which very many will find that there is, is happening as a result of the pandemic. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. I think it is a really worrying series of trends and, you know, we really risk falling back if we haven't already. Um, and from a policy perspective, you know, my career before getting involved in technology education was in think tanks and public policy. And I do think we need specific policy and specific focus on women. And I mean, additional points that you didn't mention, obviously, the rise in domestic violence because people are stuck at home and also 
um, you know, what happens with the disruption to education, because of course, if you're in those kind of more tenuous jobs and suddenly the school shuts down, which happened to me this week, both my children have now been sent home to self-isolate. Um, you know, depending on the job you do um, and your resources, that can completely destroy your ability to work and you can actually lose your job or lose your income. So yeah, we need to think how we can get technology working to try and mitigate some of these problems. But I think there's also a, a policy response that probably goes beyond technology. I want to bring Nena in here now because this is what you work on a lot is the issue of the digital divide. Um, and obviously digital divide exists and exists, I think every in every country. Um, but how have you seen um, this progressing since COVID-19? Do you think COVID-19 has accelerated the gaps between us when it comes to technology? Hello, everyone. My name is Nenna. I come from the internet. And the first thing I want to say is, Vicky, thank you very much for bringing in the male-female divide. I would like to speak on five divides that have been made greater by COVID pandemic. So there is the male-female divide, but I would like to emphasize on the part of half the population of humanity. Half of the world are not connected. So when the pandemic hit, we are looking at half the population of the world that are offline. So the pandemic has made this divide greater. There is also the rural and the urban divide. And you've seen that with lockdown, people in rural areas have, are finding life more difficult than those in the urban areas. I may want to talk about skilled and unskilled. Like Helen, you were saying, it is very important that for you to ask someone to work from home, the person is skilled enough to work from home. We see that it is not everyone that has the capacity to work from home. And then there is one that we might not have looked at very clearly, and that is the divide between the young and the old. We have seen the data shows us that most people affected by COVID-19 are of the third age. So we have the divides between off-connected and unconnected, which already divides the global community into two. We have the divide between men and women. We have the divide between rural and urban population. We have the divide between the skilled and unskilled. And we have the divide between the young and the old. What this virus has done is to make the existing divides even greater. In what ways? As Vicky has pointed out, economic capacity, the gap in economic capacity has grown wider. The gap in capacity to use the internet has grown wider. There is the infodemic, the fake news. Everyone has almost been a victim of fake news, of conspiracy theories, of lies and all of that, and some political spinning of the pandemic itself. Now, when you are an old illiterate woman in Africa and unconnected, you get news from a third, third level resources. And most of these you can't say which is right and which is wrong. There is also the, the, the use of data. And um, I mean, in, I live in West Africa and there have been all kinds of news. No, COVID is not real. No, COVID does not kill poor people. No, <laughs> you, you, COVID only uh, attacks those who, who have used planes. No. So what, what is happening is that on the information level, on the economic level, on digital skills, on capacity to use, um, the divide is, is growing more. And if you add to that, that half the population are offline, then you, you just get, um, I know we are, we are, I don't know, Sometimes you have to call bullshit by its name. We just have half of the population on their way to being forgotten. And we are saying, leave no one behind. How can we move forward in a world of pandemic when half the population are offline? 
How can we move forward when people are losing their jobs? The same mother that has uh, a, a, a very bad, that had a very bad job, is now had a had a very bad connection. Is We're losing Nena a bit. Hopefully it will come back on shortly. Now being told to work from home, school the kids from home, and take care of the family. And so as women being lowered, I will stop so far. Thank you, Nena. Yes, I think the pressures are enormous. You know, try, and this word juggling gets used a lot, but trying to deal with elderly parents, worrying about them, trying to work and when you maybe not be able to work, trying to educate various different children on different devices and many people not having internet access, having to children having to do their homework on a mobile phone, on pay-as-you-go data, and then it runs out. You know, they can't possibly have the same level of opportunity as someone else who's got full access to, you know, a laptop and full-time high-speed broadband. And, you know, we just see that, you know, really the opportunities are so spread from one side of the divide to the other. Um, I want to come on to Priya because there are also some kind of roots of optimism and, and this is a, a conference about hope and confidence and compassion. So um, Priya works a lot with investing in female-led businesses and I know a lot of women have either set up new businesses during the pandemic or pivoted existing ones and been very, very creative and shown a lot of leadership. So I wanted to ask Priya specifically whether this has had a material impact on trends in investing and whether it's kind of boosted up um, support for both investment in kind of tech for good businesses, but also women led businesses. Um, thank you so much, Helen. And it's a real pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, I will absolutely start with a sense of optimism, um, but I'm afraid there are a few dark clouds around that, uh, which I will come on to. I think you know, the the reality is is that the pandemic has forced an acceleration of certain types of change that was happening anyway one of which was actually an increase in entrepreneurship as a viable career for people all over the world including particularly for women because entrepreneurship in many cases can give women an ability to run their own business alongside their own life in a way that can be both fulfilling, rewarding, financially successful, and also allow them to um, own their time and the way they work in a way that suits them, which I think has proven in many occasions to be a really great career opportunity for women in a way that it just wasn't the case a few decades back. The reality is though, and I see this as someone who works in the venture capital industry, what we haven't yet seen is that translating into a positive outcome for women business owners as a result of the pandemic. Just starting from one reality we've talked about, which is that you know women are disproportionately taking responsibilities in a domestic scenario. So that means that you know even though someone might fundamentally believe that actually mm -hmm. entrepreneurship is a good path for them, they might have to put those desires on hold in order to take care of homeschooling or other caring responsibilities. Secondly, what we've also seen when women have uh, started businesses is that they are frequently in sectors that have been very directly impacted by the pandemic. So areas like hospitality or beauty, which we all know have been really hit during the pandemic in every economy around the world. But um, even when we look at people who have been able to continue with their successful businesses, it is a real challenge for those women to get venture capital funding. And I'm talking very specifically around technology, the technology sector, which is the sector I, I work in. If we look at um, statistics, there's a great report that just came out yesterday, in fact, by a VC firm called Atomico, called the State of European Tech, and they refreshed their analysis of diversity data across the European tech industry. And what they showed in that report is that actually all male teams captured 90.8% 90 of capital raised in Europe. And if we look at equivalent stats for the US that came out, um, I believe it was in PitchBook for the US this year, 
the venture capital invested in female led teams is on a par with levels from 2016 having gradually risen in the interim period. It's plummeted back down to 2016, 2017 levels. So what we're seeing is that whilst women are seeing entrepreneurship as a viable career path for them, the system is not treating them on a par with their male counterparts. And that's only exacerbated when you layer the gender dynamic alongside other dynamics that um, are at play here whether that's where the people are from underrepresented minorities, whether the people are from a region that finds it harder to access those funding sources. So I think that's one of the sort of stark realities that we're facing at the moment. The other reality that I think is important to point out, and this links back to the policy conversation and the data challenge that Nena was just referring to in her remarks, which is that what we haven't seen in any country across the world is actually a focus on how are our interventions in relation to COVID impacting on uh, diverse groups in our society. We saw this starting to come to the fore with a supposition that was getting tested about whether COVID disproportionately affected people from minority backgrounds, for example. Um, but what we haven't seen is actually a a government that's taken the approach that if I'm going to make an intervention to, let's use the context of business, to give funding to support businesses, how does that affect female founders? How does that affect minority founders? How does that affect founders who wouldn't normally have access to capital and we know are already disadvantaged in the system? So data is key in my view to making sure that we are tracking the interventions that have and will be made to respond to the pandemic. And actually, I think it can take us a step further, and this maybe brings us back to the opportunity piece, which is that I think there is a missed opportunity that could be pursued more, which is actually, could we think about government interventions being used to nudge a change in behavior? So where governments are supporting businesses, could we say, well, actually, a X proportion of that funding needs to go to female founders. X proportion of that funding needs to go to minority founders. So actually government money, taxpayers money, is being made uh, to, be, to be put to use in a way that actually changes our economies and societies for the better. And that's an opportunity that I think is out there, Helen. That is a fascinating point. And we see so many winners and losers in this pandemic and they're not, not sort of based on the usual market forces, you know, there are some businesses that probably would have gone under anyway, just due to trends. But, you know, it's a lot to do with how much government support people have had. And obviously freelancers and self-employed have had much less support than uh, many other, you know, existing businesses that have had, you know, much greater levels of loans or furlough schemes and, and so on. So there is really, um, you know, kind of real kind of disparity in what's going on, I think, in you know in the kind of business world and and I mean I certainly identified with what you said about self-employment because that's why I became an entrepreneur I wanted to control my own time I wanted to juggle childcare and so on and I'm sure many other people are in the same situation and and not sure exactly how they're going to take their their businesses forward so it's a, it's a it's a kind of exciting opportunity in some ways but it's also quite frightening I think for many people um, and I think the policy response needs to be a lot more thought through, particularly with regards to women. Um, I see some Q&A coming in. Do keep um, putting your questions in the Q&A panel. We're going to have 10 minutes for Q&A at the end. So if everybody puts their questions in now, we'll be able to gather those up and come back to the panel with, with those questions uh, towards the end of the session. I'm going to come on to Jane now. And I wanted to ask Jane kind of a big picture question to zoom back out and, and ask, you know, when we talk about tech for good, what do we actually mean by that? How do we define it? And do we place kind of too much um, you know, faith in technology? Because a lot of what we've talked about in the news lately is, oh, well, technology is going to solve all these problems. We're going to have a moonshot. We're going to have, you know, this, that, and the other, these kind of terms that get used. And tech, you know, eventually, if we just put enough money into it, you know, we'll fix everything. Um, so I wanted to ask Jane, you know, does she know of real examples where she can see tech having humanitarian impacts and, and sort of what she thinks about, about what I've just said? Thank you, Helen, and, and wonderful to join the panel and thank you all of the other speakers. So let me start off with this tech for good. So I believe we are at an absolutely unique moment in time 
when technology can transform and solve a number of problems that we've lived with for decades. But how do we define tech for good? Because this is a term that's absolutely bandied around all around the globe and no one really knows what it means. So what I think it means is to purposefully and with intention design technology that maximizes the benefit to people, to the planet and to the economy and minimizes harms because we don't talk that much about minimizing harms when we're waving our arms around and talking about the next opportunity for tech. But just going on to the second part of the question, do we place too much faith in tech to solve humanity's problems? No, we do not. We do not place enough uh, faith in tech to solve humanity's problems. And when I say we, I say the people who make the decisions in the world, governments, international institutions, those who have the funds that actually could create and scale technology that would really change things. Um, I think most people are ill-educated. They don't understand the opportunity of technology for social transformation, or they're wedded to legacy systems and they're too comfortable uh, to make the changes that, need, that are needed to do it. So I think as a society, we just don't have the vision and the understanding of what can be done. And I think our leaders, um, are not getting behind this in a sustained and purposeful way. But just to the third part of your question, Helen, there are real opportunities for technology to solve humanitarian issues, and I'll stay off humanities issues, just if we think about the 70 plus million people who are displaced at the moment. Um, and technology is being used and it's well documented, both in terms of identity, financial transfers, uh, supply chain, also the use of drones and 3D printing, drones to be able to map populations on the move, to deliver vaccines and blood supplies, 3D printing to produce things that otherwise would have had to be shipped and transported to the sites that they're there. So there's a lot of uh, opportunity and real use cases. A recent report that's come out with Red Cross, Mercy Corps, Hived Online and Oxfam really talks about the genuine connection and impact that we're seeing from technology and, and really calls out for people to get together to say, let's purposely, purposefully build um, technology that can at scale impact on people's lives and future. And the last comment I wanted to make is that it is different now because 70% of the world's population uh, have access to mobile technology. There's never been a time in history that this was the case. And we also have very young populations, particularly in the emerging world who are tech literate, willing to use it, wanting to use it, um, and keen to be able to uh, make the benefits available to themselves and their communities. Thank you, Jane. I just want to ask you a follow up question about digital identity. This was a question I was going to also discuss with Janet, who I think is not able to be here just yet. But um, obviously, one of the SDG goals is um, digital identity or legal identity to everybody by 2030, which is only a decade away. Um, but we've got nearly a billion people who aren't able to prove who they are at the moment. So what do you think can be done from a policymaking perspective? Because we could probably do this with the tech right now, but the political will is not always there and the challenges are enormous to try and scale that out. So do you have a, a comment on how policymakers could accelerate that? Look, I do. And I think what's interesting, if you if you look at um, Oxfam's work in Vanuatu, which is also reported in this, in this report that I spoke of, um, they created a digital identity, which is not a registration certificate or a passport or an official doc government document to enable funds to get to people who had been impacted by the hurricane. And their use case, their project has worked. And what they're finding now is other government departments like uh, social welfare are coming and saying, oh, can we use the way that you've actually created an identi identity for these people in our government programs? So I think where the challenge exists, because you can create a digital identity, it's technologically possible. You can create, if you like, a, a kind of web of information around that identity um, through testimonials and affirmations from other people in the community that these people are, 
uh, are who they are, but are also trustworthy and so forth. But that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be accepted by any government as a verifiable, verifiable form of identity um, for government purpose. And um, I used to work as the global focal point for civil registration and vital statistics. And in every country, there's at least six different government departments that own a piece of the identity question. And so it's actually really tough you know, to get all of those on board. But it's certainly possible to create digital identities, to create portable digital identities, to create ways of affirming that people are who they say they are. It's a lot more difficult to get all of these multiple government agencies accepting it. Absolutely, yeah. I do think that's going to be one of the key foundational things that's going to allow a lot of this tech to come to people who may not have access to the funding or the health services or all of these other benefits because they're not even able to prove who they are. So I hope we can get it done in the next decade. I'm a little bit sceptical, but I hope we can. Uh, I'm going to come back to Vicky now, and I wanted to ask you whether you think technology can help mitigate any of these negative effects you were talking about, because you spoke, you know, very eloquently about the trends, but we didn't really talk about the technology side of, of what you were saying. Or do you think that actually it's the opposite, that, you know, a lot of these technologies will again disadvantage people because they're just not well understood and there's a lot of fear, you know, the rise of the robots, the things that I teach people about. Um, you know, they're not well understood by people who are very privileged, very well educated. So is that going to just disenfranchise a whole swathe of people? It's a real problem, actually, as well as an opportunity, as we've just been discussing. I mean, the, first of all, uh, the thing which is really worrying is that all the work done by the World Bank, IMF and so on, does suggest that AI is going to affect women in particular negatively not positively but negatively so therefore everything we've said about uh, targeted support that needs to go to women is absolutely uh, essential um, because what tends to be happening right now is that in the areas where women dominate in terms of the numbers they are the ones that have been as i said before uh, particularly uh, you know, customer facing if you like you have to be out there to be doing them and they've been in the areas that have been decimated by COVID but there have been the trends like someone else in the panel has said uh, perhaps it was uh, Priya uh, which have been happening anyway in terms of delayering putting uh, IT systems that take away the need to have everyone you know be there and and support the customer so you do it by yourself basically when you go into a shop or you do it online which actually means that you reduce the number of people that you need who generally are women and it's not just at the lower end of it but it's also middle managers uh in the hr people all sorts of changes that are taking place which mean huge reduction in the number of people employed in those sectors anyway happening and those reductions are accelerated actually by um by covid and that we may find that we never go back to anything like normal as was the case before so what is the answer um the answer is of course to look at new areas where technology can be used effectively which is what i think jane was talking about before where technology can really make a difference but you require the skills and if you end up with women not being reskilled to be able to work in those areas then you lose out very significantly and also the use of those uh, new ways of doing business, such as uh, you know, the gig economy. In other words, you know, uh, people who don't actually rely on, on sort of proper jobs, but are based on a platform working. So IT can be in such, used in such a way that you respond to a platform and to some uh, request for your services. That generally means that you get paid, in fact, quite low wages. And if that is where the women end up, then that's a serious problem again in terms of prosperity and so on. One final thing, of course, you can have huge, huge potential for growth if you use technology properly. You can improve women's health all across the world. You can improve communication. You can improve and do something about this, this huge market failure that exists, which is information asymmetries. So basically, people don't know what's going on, don't know what jobs exist. They, they, they really are disadvantaged by that. And if you spread that across the world, then you can make quite a big difference if you do it right. But what, what we find, uh, though, is that certainly COVID, and I think that might actually stay uh, um, the case, um, has, you know, by, by using technology, we can see more clearly what is happening. If we could use it the right way, that would be interesting. Because one of the, the, the most exciting findings that I have seen is that you can use Vodafone or other mobile technology to track people's movements um, and, and see what's happened in relation to uh, 
uh, you know, men and women and the differences that exist. And what we found, certainly in, in, in Europe, because this was done in some of the Southern European countries, uh, there was always a difference between mobility of men and women in terms of how far they were prepared to travel to do their various jobs, something that Neymar actually uh, touched on. Um, because of course women have those responsibilities and they don't want to go too far in terms of where they find the jobs and that of course defines their pay gap anyway. If they're not traveling enough, if they can't travel enough, if they're not allowed to travel enough, then they can't have access to various jobs. What we found during the pandemic is that although there always was a difference in how far men and women work because of the points that I just made, the gap between how far and the movement of men and women has widened. And we can find that through technology. Uh, what this means is that women have less access to jobs, less ability to get you know, the pay that they should be getting and their entire families are suffering as a result. If we're able to harness that type of information to really then have the right approach in terms of you know, women's prosperity for the future, then that would be great, but it requires governments to use that, if you like, that identity that, uh, that, that we talked about before, be able to, to track what, what is happening, but in a positive way rather than a negative way and seriously help the women overcome this problem, which could become very entrenched because of the, the, the issues we've just been going through. And we may not be able to get out of it unless that technology is used the right way. Yeah, I completely agree, Vicky. And I want to bring Nena in again. Actually, one of the questions that's been asked in the Q&A is also similar to one of the questions I was going to ask to Nena, which is, um, what can we do about the people that are offline? And, and someone also asked a question about education and those that are really unable to access education. So we'd love it if you would just touch on those two questions. So I'm taking notes for my own self, learning from the ladies. Thank you very much. I want to talk about 3D. The first D is what technology can do for women, which is data. We need technology to help us build the data to show the divide, the data to show the discrimination, and the data to, to develop solutions. This, I think, is where technology can be for good for women. It is really important that we show the data because policies are powered by data. If we don't have the data that shows that, as Vicky said, that women are not equally treated at the workplace, that women's labels are not equally remunerated, that we women are bearing the brunt of the digital divide, that women are facing discrimination online, we need that data to be able to tackle it. We need it as web foundation to be able to advocate at the highest levels. The UN has started a, a digital corporation, but we need the data to put in front of all these countries to call for action. Education, everyone here has been to school. You don't have to plan for it. You have to develop the right policies for it. You have to deploy the infrastructure for it. You have to build the skills needed for education. And finally, you have to make it known that education is a right. Um, Helen, everywhere you go in some of these countries, we speak about women as if they are the, they need help. We don't need help. We need our rights respected. And education is a right, and digital education is also a right. I want to end by saying that when I was born, I was born in March, and I didn't have a name until June because I was a girl and I was not considered to be human enough technology, digital identity, data can help us rebuild the, the, the human nature of women and give us our dignity back. So that's why we are here. I'm supposed to be on leave, but I'm here to say that technology can do something for women. Technology can show data. Technology can expose abuse and abusers and technology can help develop solutions. Thank you.
Thank you, Nana. And um, I'm really moved by what you said and also by your commitment to being here during your time off. I know us women always end up working on our holidays, but I really appreciate you for being here and just the, the deep commitment that you have with everything that you've said. I think also on the data point, there's a fantastic book by Caroline Criado Perez, which talks about invisible women and how our data is not captured. So if people haven't read it, I would definitely encourage you to, to have a look at that. I'm gonna try and come on to some questions now because we're running a little bit out of time. So um, one of the questions, I'm just gonna read out a couple and then I might pick on a couple of our panelists to answer them. Hafiz um, has said, he's here from Pakistan. I think it's a he. Um, my question for all the panelists, don't you think it's high time to make worldwide digital policy for digital rights of citizens and also about data protection? Um, I think you've just sort of made that point, Nana, but the data protection is a key point and how new technology is going to potentially um, expose our data and people are very worried about their data privacy. Um, and Anne has asked, I think I'm going to ask this one to Jane, do you see blockchain as a driver for social impact? An enabler for social entrepreneurship and more importantly if so how so jane can i just bring you in back on that one uh yes look and thank you for asking the question and feel free to get in touch with me offline i mean the answer to that briefly is i absolutely think that blockchain has the most extraordinary potential to be able to be a power for tremendous good in terms of social impact whether it's identity, whether it's financial inclusion, supply chains, climate change, climate finance, um, gender equality, there are so many applications where blockchain has the potential to make exceptional change in the world. Um, it just goes back to the comment that I made before, however, is that this and many other of these technologies are in an emergent state. And so we have not yet seen you know, global application of blockchain at scale. We've got a lot of really good and growing evidence about the places uh, that blockchain can be used and what its benefits are, but we have yet to see it at scale. There's still challenges in relation to some of the um, shortcomings of the platform. There's challenges in relation to uh, regulations and complications around sovereignty, jurisdiction, smart contracts and so forth. Uh, but there is no doubt that this is a technology that we're going to be seeing as an underpinning fundamental to many of the things that we're going to be doing in the future. But it will go hand in hand with other technologies, whether it's AI or IoT. But absolutely, it's, it's a real force for potential good. But like with all of these technologies, we need to be intentional with the design. We need to be determined to see this at scale. And as yet, as I made the point before, we are not seeing that determination in the international agencies and governments and others. You've got tech companies and passionate believers trying to advocate for it, but we have a lot more to do if we're going to create social change at transformational scale. Thank you, Jane. I've got a really great question here from Aisha, who said, as a woman in a third world country, STEM fields are primarily restricted to men and women are hesitant. And so are their families. They don't want them to go down that path. How can we cross that barrier? And how do we normalize the tech field for everyone, but women in particular? I would love uh, perhaps Priya to, to speak to that one. And then also Nena, maybe to give us a closing remark. Um, I mean, I think, first of all, actually, what, what you see frequently in um, developing countries is a better equity, actually, in STEM fields than you see in some, in some uh, European Western countries. Um, and so I think it's worth sort of flagging that, first of all, it is, not, it is not a constant series of inequities. But I do absolutely recognise what uh, she's saying there in terms of countries where uh, local norms and cultural values sometimes hold women back from um, engaging in those fields and reaching their full potential. For me, this is where role models are fundamental because you cannot expect girls to aspire to those sorts of fields if they cannot find anybody in those fields for whom they see themselves, in whom they see themselves. So it's a huge opportunity, I think, for countries where this is an ambition for the whole of society to recognize that they need to be putting in place support for women to enter those fields and putting the people who do it, the women who do it and are successful on an absolute pedestal 
so little girls in that country can see those women and understand that that is a future for them. I think one of the great things that we've seen in the COVID pandemic is actually women scientists, female scientists from all over the world, including people like Sarah Gilbert, who leads the Oxford uh, UK vaccine work, being put on this incredible pedestal so that people um, who are kids who are going through school see these scientists as people who are changing the world and can do something amazing. And that, I think, I hope, will be really transformational for future generations of female scientists. Yes, and we can see how important this is. I think one of the leaders that uh, did extremely well during the pandemic at the early stage was um, a woman politician in India, in Kerala, I think, who saw, she was a scientist by background, and she saw early on this is going to be a huge problem and she just rang a lot of her scientist friends and said what should be the policy what should we do how should we organize very very early stage and that really kept the number of cases of COVID-19 down in that region in India so you know this is not just sort of tokenistic thing we want women's rights it's it's you know people's lives are at stake if we have scientists at the top levels of policy making we can see how beneficial that is right now in the, the current situation that we're in. So maybe just a closing remark from Nena. I mean, obviously role models are hugely important. Anything else you think from a cultural perspective we could do to change? Education obviously is key as well. I know women um, only schools in Africa have made a huge impact in certain places. Um, I had a lot of things to say, but I'm mindful of time. And so the Web Foundation uses the React plus content and targets. So we must understand that women development is a right. But then I want to say that that's why we are here. That's why Athena 40 is here, so that we have more women role models. And uh, Priya has talked about investment. We need to invest in these women so that they keep being who they are and building other women. My mother, was a health professional. I am a tech leadership professional and my daughter is a programmer. So ladies, if you are in this panel, if you are here today, it is for a reason so that you can do your part and I will do my part. And by next year, we will have more women in STEM. Cheers. Thank you, Nana. I couldn't think of a better way to close the panel. Thank you to all of the panelists for your wonderful comments. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but do follow up. I'm sure any of the panelists will be happy to contact you directly uh, via LinkedIn or email or, or any other form of social media. And I'm going to hand it back to Marco now to take us over to this next session of Athena 40 Forum. Thank you, Marco. Great. Great.